first things first to kick things off today. a requirement you won't need to check that in your code at all you can just assume so the interface is you're given an interface so a physical interface you're given the victim IP a victim Ethernet address a reflector IP and a reflector Ethernet so yes you you can assume that those are on your same subnet you don't have to worry about that 
The person running your program has to worry about that. You also don't have to worry about are those IP addresses already taken by somebody else. Uh, that's something that your co uh, that the person running your code should do. Yeah. Will it be like automatic test cases where we can like upload it and see if it like passed all of them? Yes, there will be. Uh, I have the site up. I need to tweak it a little bit to get everything running. And, um, but I will have that up. I'll send out the information Wednesday at the latest. So you can go there. I don't think any of you is going to finish in two days. Um, but yes, there will be a submission site for all of this. Yeah. So, I mean, mine is uh, Lecter. Is it on the Lecter site? Is it on the machine? This is on this machine. It says listen to interface zero, PTA zero. Any packets that get sent to the victim IP should get reflected back to that source IP from this reflector IP. And then any replies to those packets get sent back to that source IP address. Uh, okay. So it's like two different machines. So You're our, essentially impersonating two different machines, yes. So uh, for our tools, can we, if you want to test it locally, is our, vic can our victim and our virtual machine be different on the system? No, 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 they're not machines. These are not machines. Your program is simulating these machines. There is no victim machine. There is no reflector ID. How would you simulate an IP address on your local graph on your local network? to this IP address, and what should you get back if that machine exists? An ARP reply, right, that says, I am this IP, I am at this physical interface, or I'm at, I have this physical link address, right? So as a program, you can do that, right? You can listen to the network traffic, sniff the network, see, are there any ARP requests for this 192.168.1.10? If there are, reply to that ARP request with, this is my Ethernet address. Similarly with the reflector, so no, there should be no extra virtual machines in here. You're pretending to be two different other IP addresses. Yes? Sorry, it's a dumb question. No. Nope. Um, do we have to program, from programmatically set our interface to promiscuous mode, or we assume we can do that manually outside? Of assume that it's done with whatever um, permissions are being used in your sniffing program. So all of the, the interfaces will handle that for you. Uh, wait, okay, let me think about that more. Uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about it in your code. Yeah, it'll be fine. And the other thing, the little caveat with this assignment is that um, your code needs to be run as root in order to get access to raw sockets. Uh, so this means the submission system will essentially be running your code as root, so don't do anything <laughs> stupid.
the initial Axiom uh, ARC request for that mm -hmm. IP address that you're trying to spoof. Yeah, so how can you do that? Ping, Ping what? The victim IP. Ping the victim IP, then what should happen? You, get a reply. you should get a reply <laughs> only if the machine that you're pinging it from would give a reply. Right? So you can run it locally, you can also test it on a different machine on your network, right? If you try pinging that IP address on your local network, you should, uh, the victim IP, you should get a response if your machine gives a response. Yeah? Could you set this up with multiple network interfaces on the same system? Could you set it up with multiple network interfaces? You could, uh, but we, when you run the command, you tell it exactly which interface to listen to. So you don't need, your program doesn't need to worry about that. Yes, but I could just basically victimize the other application. Victimize? <laughs> I don't know that that's the term I'd use. Uh, you're essentially just telling it what interface to listen on, right? So which physical device to listen, physical port or Ethernet, uh, Wi-Fi to listen to, right? And then so then the question is which IPs is your victim, so which IP, when they try to either ping that victim, they'll get pinged. If they try to attack that victim, they'll actually get attacked um, because they'll actually be attacking themselves. So what's that IP address? And then what's that ethernet address? And the reflector IP and the reflector ethernet <coughs> specifies when you're sending those back to whoever pinged you on this victim, who are you sending those from? So yeah, there shouldn't be any other interfaces, just one interface. I mean, I guess you could change it to do that, but that'd be a little more complicated. Yeah. Uh, so one IP address, uh, that would be our uh, actual IP address, and other will be paying for one IP. There are a total of three IP addresses in play. So there's, let's say, call them the attacker, even though they may not be attacking us. We'll call them the attacker IP address. There's the victim IP address and the reflector IP address. So packet comes in from the attacker to the victim, right? Your program's listening for that, right? It's happening all in the same interface. Your program's listening for that. It sees the packet. <coughs> it says, okay, to respond to this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send this packet, change the source address to now be the destination address, and set the source address to be the reflector IP, send that packet out on the network. That'll go to the attacker's IP. They'll send a response back where? to the reflector IP, right, because that's who we sent the packet from. Then we take that packet, change, put the source to be the victim IP, and send that out back to the attacker. So they'll see that as the response to their initial packet. So three IP addresses. So pretty much we're doing man but we're not. It's man in the middle, kind of, but it's coming to you, right? So you're, you're saying instead of actually responding to this packet the way I would, I'm gonna respond however the attacker would. Right. So like if they ask you for a web page, you'll actually ask them for a web page and you'll return that web page back. If they ask you to try to SSH into your machine, all those packets will actually be sent back to them so they'll end up SSHing them <coughs> themselves. If they send you some kind of denial of service traffic or some kind of exploit traffic, right? You don't actually do anything with that. You send that back to them. So they'll think that they're attacking that victim IP when really they're attacking themselves. Cool. Think about it. You the man left the questions. Okay. Part three. So part three is pretty fun. Uh, this one we get to go into some low level C networking. Uh, so specifically on this, because C is such an important part of what we're gonna look at in application security. We're gonna look at buffer overflows, of C programs, all kinds of cool stuff like that. Uh, you need to be familiar with C code, and the best way to do that is by writing some. Uh, so you're gonna write a backdoor web server. So the idea is, once you've taken over somebody's machine, right, you want, still want access to that machine. And what is, what would you say is the most common type of traffic on the internet? Foreign traffic. 
possibly, but you won't have to worry about that. It would be just like as if they're typing it in from the command line, so. Yeah, I don't have to override any limits from system. No, 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 don't worry about that. No, it's more about uh, don't try to split on just slashes, right? Because you could have ls space slash, right? That would be list out what's in the root directory. Um, you want to actually see that result. You don't want to try to get everything from exec to the first slash. Yeah? Uh, in which directory command should be run? Wherever. Wherever it runs. I mean, that's... You mean the, the normal web server? But the command will be run somewhere in some, on some other place. When we test it, yes. When we test it, we will run it and do everything all locally to make sure it works. Um, but when you're testing it, yeah, you need to... It shouldn't matter where it's located except for the fact that the commands that depend on what directory, like ls, will list out the current directory. Right? So that will depend on where your server is. What should be the default directory for the server? Whatever directory it's run in. Yes? Are you going to try to kill the web server over Uh, No. Uh, let's see. No, nothing. Oh, yeah, it's this part here. That's right. Are you going to attempt to kill it with the web request? Because you have the information. Will I attempt to kill it? Uh, wait, okay, two things. A, when the server is killed, so control C or sig int, uh, the server should release the port and safely terminate. So this is good server programming. Um, you, This one doesn't need to be run as root. And we'll see listening on ports above 1024 does not require root permission. So this one doesn't necessarily have to run as root. Yes? Should the server be executing commands in root mode? No, it should execute it just as whatever user it's running as. So if you run it as root, it will execute. If you did sudo uh, normal server, it will run as root. If you just run normal web server as a different user, it should run as whatever that user. You don't, you don't have to do anything special. I mean, yeah, don't do that. It's part of your testing. But yes, that is the functionality built in. Yes. Other questions? Cool. All right. On to fragmentation. All right, all this link doesn't work. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm trying to set up. The reason why it's taking so long is I have everything all set up. I just need to uh, create. I want to use HTTPS this time, but it's a little bit tricky using you know, a proxy in our lab. Oh, that's okay. But anyways, I'll talk about that when I send out. Okay, so it should be all good, but we'll see. Yeah. Are you going to have test cases um, on the same server set similar to 340? No. 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 You'll have to come up with your own test cases. There will be test cases on the server. Before, let's see, before I had secret test cases where I wouldn't give you anything, I don't know if I'll do that this time. So what kind of fragmentation are we talking about here? Somebody remind us from Wednesday, which feels like an eon ago. Yeah. Packet fragmentation. What's being, so fra packets are being fragmented, why? Too big for who or what? Ethernet, the link layer. Yeah, so they, remember we saw that IP packets can be 65,000 bytes or higher than that. Right, but the link layer Ethernet can only be 1,500 bytes. So what happens when that happens? Right, the idea is we need to break that packet up into tiny fragments and then send it across. So this is exactly what happens. So fragmentation can either be performed at the source host. So if the you know the host knows for whatever reason the MTU, the minimal transmissible. Oh, maximum stuff. Maximum <coughs> transmission unit, if it knows the exact size or the most size that could possibly be sent, it can fragment there. Otherwise, any of the other routers could possibly fragment uh, on any of their hops. Uh, and so, if, so there's a flag called do not fragment. So if you're sending a packet and there's a do not fragment flag set, then instead of being fragmented, you'll get an air ICMP error message back that says, hey, you tried to send this packet, sorry, it was too big for the network. So
So we looked at the IP diagram, right? And we kind of went over this briefly, but some of the things we didn't talk about. So we have the flags. So inside the flags, we have bits of <coughs> don't fragment. So this is what we just talked about. This would tell any router along the way, hey, do not fragment this packet. We have another field for more fragments, which we'll talk about in a second. We also have the fragment offset. So if we actually can fragment a packet, this is kind of the process. So first of all, we want to send, so what are we going to be fragmenting in here? So this is the packet. The data, right? The problem is the data is too large. Right? So then we have to split the data up into NTU chunks. So that's going to give us different chunks of these packets. But we need, what do we need from that? Order. Yeah, we need to know at the other end how to put those packets back together again. Right? Because we've cut them all up. There's no guarantee that even if we send them out one after another, that they'll be received in that order. Right? These are IP packets. There's no guarantee about the delivery or the order or anything. Right? So that receiving end needs to have enough information to be able to place all the packets correctly. What else do we need? Number. Number. We need to know how many there are. Right? And we need to make sure that all of these headers are exactly the same. Right? We want to make sure that this pack, all these packets get to the correct destination. Right? And so that's what this process is going to do. So we're going to copy the datagram ID. So this datagram ID in this header is oh, the identifier here. That's the IP identifier. That's going to get copied. So that way, the receiving end also knows that we're from the same packet. Right? If the identifiers are different, that means it's a different packet even if they're also fragmented. Uh, more fragments flag is set. So it's going to be one for all of the pack, all of the fragments, except for the last fragment, which will be zero. The fragment offset field tells it where in the data this should be offset. So where does this packet go when you're constructing this the, the final packet? So where does this fragment go when you're constructing the final packet? It's a little tricky because it's expressed in 8-byte units. So 1 would be mean 8-byte offset, 2 would mean 16-byte offset, and so on. The total length field uh, will be changed for each fragment to match the size of the fragment. And now each fragment goes on its way and gets routed and hopped in exactly the same manner as any other IP packet. Um, now, this incurs some risk, right? Because any one of these fragments gets lost, the entire packet's gone. There's no checksum, there's no redelivery, there's nothing, right? We're just trying to do our best with unreliable link layers to complete the process. But if we can't do it, then we can't do it. So you can see here, this is a TCP trace, a TCP dump output from 128, 2.70. And we can see that all of these, these are all fragmented packets. And then at the end, we can see with all these packets that it's an ICMP echo request. So this is a ping uh, request that we're getting here. Um, and they can come in kind of any order. So this leads to fun attacks that used to occur. All right? Because now we're asking the endpoints and maybe even routers in between to do extra work. Right? Now, when you get some fragments back, the operating system has to correctly uh, reassemble those in all the right places, but they don't actually know at the start whether they've gotten every fragment. Right? Because it actually doesn't send the total number of fragments. What does it send? Yeah, so it uses offset, right? So each fragment will have a different offset. And then how do you know when you've got the last fragment? Zero. Yeah, zero for the more fragments. 
That's the only thing. So what happens if you lose that fragment? Then you'll never know what the end is. You'll never know when the end is, and you still have to time out and eventually throw that packet away, right? Because you never got that final piece, right? How does how, do, how would you know, how would the host know if it missed any fragments in between? Let's say it got the final one. <laughs> yeah, so it knows exactly. So it knows each, so if it knows the last one, and it knows the offset of the last one in the packet, then it knows how much data it should have gotten, and it can keep track of all the fragments at every place in there, and it can see if it's got all the fragments. This seem complicated? Yeah, it's complicated, right? It's not straightforward, it's not easy. You have to keep track of all this stuff. This should be a hint if you're ever writing a spec or you're trying to audit a spec or audit even any kind of application. Anything complicated like this, it's like Murphy's Law, can and will go wrong, and that's exactly what happens. So that's how we get uh, different attacks like the ping of death, where essentially what they would do is they would alter the last packet to make the operating system kernel, so it's handling all this IP reassembly, it would cause it to overflow the size of the maximum allowed packets. So it would allocate a buffer to wait for some packets that were coming in for fragmented packets, and it would change the size to be really, really large and cause it to overflow that packet. Uh, or overflow that packet and start overwriting kernel memory. So what would happen? A kernel panic. What happens when a kernel panics? It drops all the packets that are coming through. It drops everything. It dies. It's like the Linux equivalent of a blue screen. Hmm. Right? It just dies. Everything dies. You lose all the packets. Right? So think about this. So somebody found this out. There's a bug in here. Now what can you do just by sending a few packets? You can take down, well, a network route. I think these were end hosts, so I think these were only, I think it's probably Linux or Unix machines that were affected by this. Oh, maybe Windows too. Um, but if you can't take out the routing infrastructure, then what happens? If you're trying to attack something, you could take down their IDS. Yeah, you could take down the IDS, you could just take down their machines, right? You hold their machine boxes. You just take down computers on the internet with just like two packets two packets, fragment packets. And what do we know about IPs? Does IP guarantee where the source IP sent the packet from? No. No, which means what? So you won't know who caused Yeah, we can spoof other people's IP addresses when we do this attack, so nobody will know where this attack is coming from. So what this would entail is sending out a bunch of fragmented packets and it would be such the case that the total reassembled packet for the last one, this 65, 120 plus 398 bytes would be the size of the fragment that was sent and it would be greater 655, 38 versus 655, 38, 35, just large enough to cause it to crash and pack. And so this was an early kind of denial of service attack that caused a lot of havoc and problems on the internet. Think about it, like a few, a few packets, like your computer just shuts down, right? It's kind of, it seems like, well, it doesn't seem like, it'd be like the equivalent of a bank, if you just like tapped on the door, like the bank would just open up, right? That'd be like the equivalent here, right? So these are just people coming to talk to you. You're not even responding to them. You'd just be somebody just talking to you, and you're like, oh yeah, come in. And you're like, I didn't even say anything, I just stood here, right? And so this is a kind of a theme that we'll see looking at all of these, is a lot of the early bugs were bugs at the kernel layer IP TCP stack, because if you found one bug in those, you could attack every operating system that was running that, uh, that operating system, right, in that TCP IP stack which was almost all systems. Well, eventually over time, the operating systems got better and better and fixed a lot of these bugs, where now it's very difficult to get these kind of remote, just kill off of a few packets getting sent. Um, so then we'll see where people moved up to again. I guess that makes sense how you just get access when the kernel crashes. How does that give you full access to the computer? Uh, this was a little over-exaggeration, but 
you don't actually get access, but you're shutting them down, right? So you're compromising their security by taking away their availability, right? So then you could call them up and ask for a ransom. Be like, hey, it really sucks that those computers are getting <laughs> taken down. You should wire some bitcoins to my Bitcoin address. <laughs> Uh, maybe that'll go away, I don't know. Uh, you know. That could be one way to do it. There's also other types of attacks that are similar to this that allow remote code execution, so you would able to get onto their machines, but this is an early one that was very annoying. This is the ping of death, ping of death. So fragmentation is not just something that is interesting because it leads to these kind of weird corner cases. Uh, they actually have a lot of interesting applicability and kind of give light to some interesting security principles that we can talk about. Uh, so one key way that these can be used is essentially, so somebody talked about um, IDS, so an intrusion detection system, right? So one of the key ideas in security is you're always under attack. I hope you agree with that. As an organization, you're always under attack. And so you want to know when you've actually been compromised, right? Sometimes just knowing that is difficult. And so that is why you run like intrusion detection systems, which look at network traffic to try to see if you've been uh, hacked or breached. And so as an attacker, you know that the good guys are using these things. So what you'd really like to do is to try to get around them, right? So what are some other, so we have IDSs, what are some other technologies that companies or organizations use to protect themselves and their network? What was that? Firewall. firewall. what's a firewall? Yeah, it's just a machine that sits in between, usually the outside and the inside network, and it has a set of rules that say, Nobody outside can talk to this specific internal IP address. Or maybe nobody out, the only IP and port that people on the outside can talk to is this specific machine, port 80, right? And so firewalls are a really good mechanism to try to restrict what traffic can come in. They can also be used to restrict what traffic goes out, but that's a little more difficult. And, you know, they don't really are used so much for that. So, because these are such core security mechanisms, if we're able to try to evade them, like if we can launch an attack and have an IDS not detect it, that's great for us as attackers because now we've gotten into the network and the people don't know about it, right? Similarly with a firewall, if we can actually bypass the firewall's policies and access things we shouldn't, now we can maybe use that to get a foothold into their systems. So fragmentation comes in why? Why do you think that would be useful for either evasion or something like that? If you crash the firewall? Yeah, maybe if you crash the firewall. If you crash a firewall, what should happen? Uh, no traffic goes into all the what should happen? Uh, no traffic goes in or out. Yeah, no traffic should go in or out, right? We call that fail close, right? That means that if that machine, if the firewall fails, you should have no traffic being going through because the firewall is a security mechanism and you don't want anyone to come in or out. Uh, what do you think most firewalls do if, they're, if they crash? They give open access. Yeah, they fail the other way. They fail open and just allow access to anyone. Why? People like configured correctly. What was that? People like availability. Yeah, people want availability, right? They're Networks are being used to make them money, right? People are accessing their website, their employees are working all day, right? You think about, take a 100, 200 person organization, the firewall goes down, that means nobody can access the internet, basically nobody can work for a couple hours. You think about that lost productivity. Yeah, a lot of organizations would say, no, I want to just, I want it to keep working, I don't want it to shut everything off. So uh, a lot of these things, there's probably configuration modes, but a lot of them will kind of fail open, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, so you can use a denial of service, maybe it's a firewall, to try to get it to crash. Uh, maybe using the ping of death thing. What else? So when you're talking about evasion, can we like 
So you gotta think like IDS is listening to all traffic coming into the organization. So can we like evade it by going around it and going into some other route into the organization? That's a good one. I want to go back to the um, evasion idea. idea. Can you force your traffic to go another route not through their IDS or their firewall? You could tap it. But can you force your traffic to go somewhere else? Proxy chains. Proxy chains? Of what, though? You're on the outside. You can't touch their network, right? If you can touch their network, everything becomes a lot easier. All right, but assume you're completely on the outside. VPN? VPN? Did you, did you pretend to be on the local network? Pretend to be on the local network? Depends on the firewall setup, but hopefully not. <laughs> right. So fundamentally, we have to think they control their network, right? You have to assume they're semi, I mean, some level of competency, which is that all incoming traffic is going to go through the IDS of the firewall. Right? So you can't evade it by trying to go some other route because that route doesn't exist. Right? The organization has set it up. They, just like you at home, have an ISP that they're buying their internet from. And so they can set it up very easy and physically such that all traffic goes through that firewall or that intrusion detection system. So when we talk about evasion, we can't think like, oh, we'll somehow just get it around there, right, if we're just on the outside. So then what would that mean? Impersonate a familiar IP address. What was that? Impersonating a familiar IP address. We could try impersonating a familiar IP address. Uh, yeah, that could work, hopefully would not work, um, depending. Um, yeah, we could do that, yeah. If there's a machine that's in the DMZ that's maybe not in the same path as the IP address, Yeah, we want our IDS listening to everything, right? So we'll put it right on the edge, right on the edge, yeah. We could fragment the packets in a way such that the IDS would not detect them. Why would it not detect it? It wouldn't notice some malicious pattern. What does the intrusion detection system have to do? Port of the packets. So it has to listen to all the packets coming across. When can it make a decision whether a packet is good or bad? When it gets everything, right? So, who wrote the IDS? I don't know, just make something up. It's not, a, it's not a guess what's in my mind situation. Uh, their security? Yeah, some security company, right? Let's say they're using, I don't know, well, BSD is a bad example. We'll say they're using like Linux or something, right? Whatever. Whatever they're using, they're using some networking layer there, right? And let's say our servers and our systems are Windows. Are those the same IP TCP layers? Yes. Are they? They were written by the same people? Linux IP layer is the same as Windows? It should be following the same standard. It should be following the same standard, but who is the code written by? Different companies, different organizations, right? There may be different and subtle bugs that can happen in each different operating system. And essentially, you can exploit those differences in order to cause, let's say, the IDS to disregard your traffic, but that packet actually gets through to the host machine. So for instance, what happens if you overlap some of the fragments? What happens, right? Does, the spec doesn't say anything about that, right? About what to do. But you're an OS writer, right? You know this is gonna happen, or maybe you don't, it's just a byproduct of however your code's written, right? Do you ignore the, so you have a first packet come in, you have a second packet that overlaps. Do you keep the first packet and then append whatever was after it? Do you actually just paste over and now the middle of that packet becomes packet two? Or do you reject this fragment and say, no, I'm not gonna do any overlapping packets? Right? None of this is detailed in the spec, 
which means that if the machine I'm targeting and the intrusion detection system diverge, they will see two different truths as to what this packet is. And so I can use that by hiding my malicious, that's kind of what we mean by evasion, right? We can make the IDS think that it's seeing something different than a host machine is actually seeing. Um, and so you can play all kinds of games with this. Um, this would be another thing, so for firewalls specifically, right, they are sitting, so an intrusion detection system is just listening, right? It's sniffing everything that's going on the network. A firewall is sitting in between inside and outside. It has to decide when to let things go. So it gets the first packet of a fragment. Does it send it on? Does it wait? How does it decide? Right? A lot of times they'll use TCP or port information, but you can kind of arbitrarily size fragments, right? So you can make a really tiny fragment that only has part of the TCP header, and then the firewall has to decide. So what if it just hangs on to that packet and waits to try to reassemble it? Then what would happen? It'd be slow, and what else? You don't get the guarantee it's going to happen. It's going to reassemble it. You don't know how it's going to reassemble it. It may reassemble it differently. What if we send a bunch of different fragmented packets but never send the end packet? And then keep on waiting. Yeah, it'll keep on waiting and it'll keep allocating memory, waiting and waiting and waiting for these packets. And so maybe we can overload the firewall and get it to fail open and just cause it to crash that way. Um, yeah, so this is what we said. So we can send, we can remember inside of our IP packet is going to be either a TCP or UDP packet. So if we send only the first eight bytes of there, that doesn't necessarily give the firewall enough information to make a decision, and so it depends on how they've written that. Uh, we can change different packets to try to get the first one through. Uh, we can try to do overwriting by what we said of trying overlapping packets, what happens when we overlap packets. Um, in some cases we may, with overwriting, be able to change the source and destination packet. So now you think a packet comes in, you say, yeah, this is great, send it on. And another packet comes in that actually overwrites part of that and changes the destination port that you were talking to. Right? So you essentially desync the view of this packet from your security device and the host machine. Sorry. So again, depending on the IDS, the IDS for you know performance reasons just like we said, may not reassemble the packet, right? Because then it has to do the same thing and try to keep all the maybe half open packets or half enough packets open. Um, we can maybe build, like we said, a denial of, of service attack by trying to force either a firewall or an IDS to allocate more memory than it has by sending a bunch of half finished packets and trying to see where that gets us to force the system to use a large amount of memory. So this is uh, kind of a really cool security idea, an attack idea that comes up in different contexts, is how do you, if you have two systems, right, and they're maybe talking the same protocol, but it's not exactly the same code that's running, maybe you can exploit differences between the two to cause different behavior. Cool. Questions on this? Fun with fragments. Yes, they're different. <laughs> uh, so there's actually a tool I think we'll get back to key, uh, we'll get to it uh, when we kind of finish all the networking stuff, but uh, Nmap is a network, awesome networking tool. It has an option to do OS fingerprinting. And so what it'll do, there's parts of the spec on TCP, UDP, TCP, IP, UDP. Uh, there's like corner cases that aren't well specified. <laughs> And so each operating system does it differently. And so there's a program that's compiled that that will do network tests remotely 
to try and determine what operating system is running on that computer. Uh, so yeah, there's actually a lot of different, there's, I, you know, some of them are, uh, we haven't gotten to TCP, but what happens if you send a TCP reset packet to a connection that you haven't even started yet? Do you do nothing or do you respond and say like, go away? Those are things that aren't specified in the spec, but you could do whatever you want. Um, same things, I don't know, there's all kinds of weird differences. Like, what happens if you're talking and then, it, then I say I want to stop talking, and then I start talking again? Like, what do you do? Do you kill it? Do you, how do you respond? So, using that, they're able to fingerprint all these tiny differences, and they can actually be very accurate. ICMG, okay, so we finally get a look at this ping protocol part that we've been using. Um, so the idea basically behind the ICMP is, okay, we're starting to build these complicated networks, and with the link layer, these are basically machines that are local to us, right? They're on our local subnetwork. With IP, now we're talking to remote machines that are multiple hops away. Our packets are traversing across networks that we don't control and that are owned and used by who knows what. And so ICMP is kind of like the debugging protocol of IP. So this allows us to say things, like for instance, um, if we set the don't fragment plaque, don't fragment bit on a packet, the, if a, a router needs to fragment that packet, it will send us an ICMP message that says, hey, sorry, I couldn't, you know, your packet was lost because I had so it exchanges control messages, error messages. Uh, they're inside the IP diagram, so there'll be a specific flag in the IP header that says this is actually an ICMP message. Uh, they can be either requests, where you're trying to get something from somebody else, responses, where you're responding to somebody's request, or error messages, right? And so this is when a computer can say, hey, sorry. Uh, we also saw another one. We saw uh, host down, or no route to host. So if you, you can actually try this, if you take your computer, start pinging some remote IP address, whatever, uh, I would try google.com or something, uh, and then you go to your, let's say your cable modem and just unplug it, you should start getting error messages back that say, well A, your internet should go out, otherwise you have magical networking. B, you should get ICMP messages back from your router saying, hey, there's no route to get these packets out, sorry. <coughs> And so it'll actually send you, and error messages will include the header and a portion of the payload, eight bytes of the offending IP diagram, so that your system can actually try to figure out what packet sent this error. The message format is pretty simple. We have a type, a code, a checksum, and the data. So pretty easy. You know, this is, this is also a good design principle. If you're trying to make something that's used for errors or debugging, you should make it very simple, right? You don't want there to be errors in your error. What happens if one of these ICMP fails, right? You just get into a spiral of terribleness. Okay. <coughs> there are lots of different types of messages. Um, these are all old, not really used. I have never seen any of these before. Uh, echo request and reply, these are kind of the bread and butter of what ICMP is used for. Uh, it's basically used to test connectivity, right? So the idea is you send an IP packet, an ICMP packet to a, sort, a destination IP, and you request and say, hey, are you alive? And then they will listen for that. If their computer is configured to respond, they will say, yes, I'm alive, and send you an ICMP reply, echo reply back, and you'll get a packet back. This is super useful if you've ever done any kind of networking stuff. We had this crazy issue in our lab where the students would be using our lab network and trying to SSH into our servers, and then their connections would just drop. And then it all of a sudden seemed to be working, so I, I wrote a script to every, I think, 10 seconds ping local IPs inside ASU and outside to Google and other things. And then I did a graph, and you could see like every 30 seconds, the network would just drop and then magically go back up 30 minutes. Oh no, not 30 seconds, 30 minutes. So about 30 minutes off, 30 minutes on, 30 minutes off, 30 minutes on, it was insane. Um, and did you figure out the problem? 
No, no. Uh, I they, what they did is they moved our network because in ASU we're all in all these virtual networks. So they moved our network around until it stopped. Is basically the answer. Wasn't my deal, but I got them to fix it. That was the important part. Actually, proved that there was a problem. Um, time exceeded, so that's an important one that's going to come up. Right? What happens if that TTL value reaches zero? Why do we want somebody to know when that happens? Yeah, so we can do something about it, right? So you know, maybe we can, maybe we can't. Maybe there's a loop somewhere else, but hey, if nobody knows about it, then we're kind of uh, not good. A redirect message, so if you're trying to send traffic to a host that's not actually a gateway and can't go anywhere else, they may actually try to redirect you somewhere else and say, hey, you should actually talk to this other host instead. Uh, when you said destination unreachable, so that's if we can't get our packet there. So let's look a little bit more deeply at the echo request and reply. So used by the ping program, ping's awesome. <coughs> the type is going to be either 0 or 8, where one responds to a request, one responds to a reply. The code will be 0, have a checksum. It'll have some identifier. Why is an identifier important? <coughs> What was that? Yeah, so we're going to send, we're going to ask you, hey, are you alive? And you're going to say, yes, I'm alive. But how do I know that you actually responded to my specific message? Right? So I'll generate some identifier, and that way you'll send that identifier back to me so I'll know you actually got it. There's actually a little bit more in there. There's a sequence number two. So you can actually ping and increase a sequence number from zero all the way up to how many bytes this is. And you need to send data. And if you send data, you're asking the other side to actually send you that data back. And so this way you can verify that what you sent on the network is what you actually get back. So that the other side read what you sent. So you can I highly recommend you play with this tool. It's super fun. Um, so you get nice. So this is, I'm pinging 129.168.1.1, and I'm from 192.168.1.100, and it's saying ping is automatically putting in uh, some data in there to see what gets back. Uh, 64 bytes of data. So we can see here, <coughs> what are some interesting things that we can see here? Okay. Yeah, so we can see, so we know if we sent seven packets, we got seven packets back because of the sequence number. Right? This means we did not lose any packets. Right? Because this is IP, we're just trying to send stuff. There's no guarantee that we actually ever get anything back. We also get the time, so the time is interesting. This is if you're ever trying to debug weird network jitter problems or trying to see how fast your internet is. Uh, ping can be kind of a useful baseline to try to see how, how many seconds it's taking. What is this time exactly? Round trip time. Yeah, round trip time, right? This is the time from when you sent it to the other machine, they got it and sent it back to you. Cool. You also have a TTL value, which is interesting. And it'll give you some very basic statistics so you can kind of try to measure the network jitter. It's also fun because it led to a lot of attacks which seems silly because this is a very easy protocol. You send a request, you get a reply, right? <coughs> OK, so one thing, I don't think I gave my how do you break into a bank speech yet. Um, how do you break into a bank that you've learned from movies? What's the first step? Well, the first step is you assemble a team. We've always missed that step. <laughs> That's be a montage form. What's the next step? So you got your team. You plan. What's part of planning? Getaway vehicle. You get a getaway vehicle. Maps. So you're trying to get maps. Why do you need maps? Yeah, you want to try to plan a route. What else do you do? Do you just stay in your little like secret lair and plan everything? Assign activities. What was that? Assign activities to team. A 
sign activities? Okay, good. Recon. Well, recon. Re what does that mean? Reconnaissance. Yeah. So you're going, they call it casing the joint. That's like the slang, right? You go and you wear disguises and you pretend to eat across the street while you observe the bank and you see who's going in and out. You're trying to look for when are the, when do the security officers get there? Uh, what time do they get off? When do they change shifts? Uh, and you may do this for several days, for maybe weeks even, so that you know the habits of the people in the bank, right? You know, oh, this guard always goes around the corner for a smoke break at three o'clock. Uh, so maybe that will give you an in there, right? So all these things, talking about the importance of reconnaissance, right? You need to know, understand the layout of whatever you're trying to attack or break into, right? So here we have a mechanism where you can ask any IP address, hey, are you alive? Could that be useful for reconnaissance? Yes. Yeah, so one of the you know, most simplest attacks, an attack, you know, I don't know where we're the words, but uh, this is called a ping scan or an IP sweep. You get it, so assuming you're in a local network, you don't know anything about it, you do know you're on a local network, so you know your subnet. That means you can iterate over all IP addresses in your subnet and just try pinging every single one. And then when you get back will be legit IP addresses, unless they're running a reflector, in which case they'll get one more than they think. <coughs> So you just send echo diagrams to everyone in the host. You collect the approaches and try to see who's alive. Um, so Nmap is a tool that we'll talk about a good amount. Um, this is another tool that you have to be careful with. Um, you want to, again, only run this on your local network with machines that you own. Um, because, you know, you're trying to, if you're just trying to ping every machine in the network, A, that's very noisy, and B, it's not really a great, like, networking neighbor style thing to do, right? Um, if it's unethical, I mean, we can have that discussion, that's kind of a more difficult question, uh, but you're getting into gray territory, so you want to be careful. Um, so you can run this. And it would tell you on your, you have to you know, specifically configure how you want it to run and that you want an IP scan. Uh, NMAP is actually an incredibly complicated tool which has lots of different options. Um, <laughs> you can look it all up. Um, but yeah, you can scan for local IPs on your local network to see who all is there. Uh, we can also perform a super cool, well you used to be able to before they fixed this, perform a very cool denial of service attack, which also has a really cool name of Smurf. Uh, so this is one of the first kind of leverage-based denial of service attacks. So the other one we saw was just exploiting a kernel, basically buffer overflow to cause the kernel to crash. Right? So they're going to need two packets, essentially, to take out the computer. With the Smurf attack, the Smurf attack was different. It actually used the concept of leverage for denial of service. So, uh, first of all, what is denial of service? Uh, overflowing a computer with service requests with packets. Uh, more broad than that. Yeah. Yeah, bringing down the availability of a system, right? I mean, you could do it in a lot of different ways. You could just cut the cord to their computer, right? Uh, that would definitely be a denial of service attack. Uh, but, you know, we want to look at, uh, so yeah, most of the ways it's done now is sending too many packets to one machine to try to get it so that it can't respond to normal requests and taking off the availability that way. Uh, so, I have my machine, let's say at home, hypothetically, I have this machine at home, can I just launch a denial of service attack at like google.com? No. Why not? Because they can detect that you're sending too many packets. Can they? Do you think they even bother? They Doesn't like TCP have like over, like, uh, it only lets you send them 
Uh, let's, even just I, IP, what if I just send like a ton of ICMP, because I can ping google.com, right? You can do that in your, in your command line. You can ping google.com. I can ping them a lot and keep pinging them. They, they can take so much, they take so many pings, they don't really care that you ping them. Though. Yeah, think about the bandwidth, right? Think about my little ISP that I'm paying for some amount of traffic, and think about Google's. Right? It probably wouldn't even fit in this room if we're doing it by scale of my original one. Right? And so how could I possibly, with my machine, generate enough packets and enough bandwidth to actually affect that all Google.com? Short answer is I really can't by myself. Right? Because I'm limited to my bandwidth. Right? So all the denial service attacks we're going to look at need some leverage. So basically, if I send one packet and Google gets one packet, that means I have to have more bandwidth than Google to take them down. That is never going to happen, right? But if I can cause it to where I send one packet and Google gets 10 packets or 20 packets or 100 packets, now we're talking and now maybe I have enough leverage and Google's a very large target. So if we narrow it down in scope to a small, medium-sized business, they're a business ISP, I don't have much more traffic than them, but if I can generate, use my traffic to cause 10 times as much traffic come to them, now I can actually perform some kind of attack. So this is the concept behind every single denial of service attack. It's all about leverage, right? Because the attacker on their own, by themselves, can't get more bandwidth, right? They have as much bandwidth as they can pay for, and then the other side, the company can pay for as much bandwidth, you know, they have the same uh, way of buying bandwidth. So let's look at the smurf attack. We'll see how it leverages this. So there's some subnetwork, 192.168.1, another 192.168.2, another one, 111.10.20. And there's this machine here that we want to take off the network. So our goal right now as attackers is the denial of service 128.111.41.10. That's our goal. We're attackers here. Cool. So what we're going to do, we're going to leverage two things. One, did I talk about broadcast addresses? No? OK, so on your local network, so we talked about subnets. So if you want to broadcast a packet on this subnet, you would send a packet to 192.168.1.255. So the local area, all one, that's always the broadcast address of a local network. Um, and that means that that packet should get sent to everyone on the network. And this was useful for all kinds of things, but, um, and it, it was, fairly standard. So it leverages this feature that a packet sent to a broadcast address will get sent to all those addresses. And it leverages another very simple feature that we knew, know about from IP packets, right? We're talking about ICMP, so this means that what can we make guarantees on the source IP? Yeah. Whatever I want it to be. You can, the attacker can put whatever source address they want to be. Right? So think about using our example. Can I just send a bunch of pings to this guy? Could, yeah. yeah. I could, but I don't get any leverage there. For every one packet I send, one packet goes to the, to the attacker here, to the victim. Right? That's not any good. But what if I was able to send maybe, so let's think about this. What would happen if I sent a, an IP packet to the broadcast address of this subnet? That packet will then go to every single one of these machines. And then, let's say it's a ping packet. Who are they going to respond to? The source. Do I want them to respond to me? No, I want to respond to the victim. Right, so I can create packets from spoof the source IP, have them pretend to be from this victim, send it to this broadcast address on this subnet, 
And what will happen is every single machine on that network will reply to that. That will send out a bunch of packets, but maybe that's not enough. So here, in this little example, I've got one, two, three, four, five. I've got like one, two, three, four. I've, got, I've multiplied my packet by four, my number of packets. Now I can send one more to 192.168.2.255, and they'll all send packets back there. And the same thing with the other network, and they're all send a bunch of packets back there. So now I'm using this broadcast ability and the fact that they'll reply back to this source IP to get leverage and to be able to generate so many packets it takes this machine off the network. Yes? How do you prevent that machine from going off the network? How do you prevent that machine from going off the network? Uh, with this attack, you have to fix this broadcast capability. So they change it to where if you're not on the local network, you can't broadcast. So this was part of the problem. If you were external trying to send back <coughs> to the local network. You have server. How do you Server from going down to you can't. Can't you just redirect all that traffic to the dead server? Uh, I mean, you if you can identify that, that traffic, but, you know, I mean, yeah, you could filter it up top, but this was back further before we knew how to do that easily and nicely. Are well, these attacks still done? No, Smurf attacks don't work anymore because they fixed this broadcast capability. Uh, but you can still spoof source IP addresses, right? It's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, somebody should look at broadcast and IP to see if it's still done. Probably. I feel like you could do it from the user network. I mean, I'm not saying you should do it, but I'm saying like I don't know. It would be could, something that could be a problem, right? If you do it from Google, from, yeah, from broadcast network. Well, the other thing is you're limited on your local network to how much bandwidth your local network has. So that would be the other thing, right? It's even if you're able to get all of them to do that, still the fact is that's not distributed throughout the internet, right? That's the important thing here is we have three, three networks here, right? And they all have different bandwidth, so it's going to be additive, right? So as long as once you saturate that bandwidth, you can't send any more packets in the Oh, is this what happens when you do like a bot on someone's computer sort of and like they can like ping all the local area networks and they can also do the same attack after? Yeah, you could. Uh, yeah, that's why I think it probably doesn't work. I don't think ICMP, or maybe they change the host so that they won't respond to a broadcast ping. That may be the thing. Like they'll only respond to pings directed at their IP address. I think that would make more sense. Yeah. Hey, hey! Still going. Got five more minutes. Uh, if we can attach a firewall to the server, yes. and if somehow that firewall can get if the mail, I mean the packet is just a ping, then we can avoid this type of attack. Ah, okay, good, good. So this is uh, similar to the other question, yes. Okay, so if, yes, yeah, so if we put a firewall in front of this, right, and then dropped all ICMP packets, then maybe the server stays up, but can anybody access us? No. Nope. Right, because we still have all of our bandwidth being used, our incoming bandwidth being used by these ping packets, right? So there's different levels of denial of service, right? They're sending so many packets that literally the kernel of the machine cannot keep up with it and starts dropping packets, right? Then they're sending so many packets that a router or a switch in here can't handle it and starts dropping packets. Then there's, you're sending so much traffic that your link layer is saturated and your ethernet literally can't send any more packets. Or there's your ISP can't even send you that many traffic. So uh, yeah, you need to get your IP to kind of redirect that, your, I, sorry, your, your ISP to redirect that traffic to somewhere else, not to you, so that that way you still get traffic. Yeah, that's that's the kind of a key a key problem with these things. Yeah, good question. Yes. Can you explain how like Cloudflare and like companies like them like prevent and, like work with us? Or just like just absorb all of it? Uh, yeah, I got a, they basically Cloudflare and the other one is Akamai, which is like the super paid version of Cloudflare. Uh, they basically have servers in every single ISP and they will Essentially, they do it like 
Part of their trick is they don't ever tell you who the real source IP website that you're talking to is. Mm -hmm. So if you try to go to a Cloudflare IP, you get IP addresses that are Cloudflare boxes. And then when you talk to them, you're saying, hey, I'm trying to get to foobar.com. And they'll look in their local cache and say, yeah, here it is. And so you never actually talk to that foobar.com. So with enough of these servers and enough bandwidth, now essentially Cloudflare has grown their pipe so big that no one person can take down just one server on it. That's at a high level kind of how they work. 